Hello, I'm Ed Lattimore, and welcome to the Stoic Street Smarts Podcast. This is where I take what I learned the hard way, and I break it down for you, so you can learn it the easy way. A while back, uh, one of the first articles I wrote for my website, edlattimore.com, was five things I learned growing up in the ghetto. Now, for people who don't know, uh, the ghetto and the projects are often used synonymously, but there is a slight difference. Um, Projects are government-run, subsidized housing. Ghettos are just generally bad areas. I grew up in the projects, and it was just as bad as any ghetto you've ever seen. Uh, The usual cast of characters, gang members, drug dealers, crackheads, and everything in between. Uh, I myself, I am the product of a single mother. Well, it's not quite accurate to say Uh, My mom was single. You know, my dad was in my life. I knew who he was, but he didn't live with me. And to say he had a hand in raising me would be uh, a gross misrepresentation. He he just wasn't around a lot. I probably saw him, you know, twice a year. I have memories of my dad, but I don't have like a strong uh, presence or I don't ever remember him like disciplining me for anything or anything like that. Uh, So my experience is effectively that of a kid who was raised by a single mom, certainly uh, financially and in terms of masculine influences. I didn't have any of those in my life, all of that. So I wrote this article, though, detailing some of the things that I learned that I think gave me an advantage in my current position in life, which is very far uh, from the projects. And, you know, for for anyone who wants to make reference or, you know, investigate my story, I'm from the Northview Heights Project in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I lived there from the age of 9 to 18. And prior to that, I lived in the Hill District in the, I believe it was called Addison Terrace Projects. I lived in Terrace Village, um, rough areas, the the kind of places, the public transportation, for example, didn't go there a lot. Uh, I remember you couldn't order pizza at a lot of these places, just, just all around war zones. But that doesn't mean you can't learn from places like this, and that's what I ended up doing. I learned quite a lot. You, and, and it's the kind of education you, you can't go to school for. You got to get taught. You got to get taken to school. I got taken to school uh, several times. And in that article, you know, I broke down many things. And, and here I wanted to kind of make a video version, not only just for people who might not want to read the article, but also to expand. I mean, there are some other things you think about. And when you go dive into your, your past, you start to remember some things that you may have blocked out or may have remember it a different way to make it easier for you to grasp as a kid coming up. We have, as humans, an incredible array of devices to deal with traumatic experiences. And, you know, people from the ghetto are no different. People from the projects are no different. I'm no different. So, uh, without further ado, I want to just get right into it and break down these lessons and, and hopefully help you out because just because I got them in that environment doesn't mean they aren't useful in in other more civilized environments. Uh, so, so one of the first things I remember was the power of good manners, you know, and when you think about a place where there's a lot of shootings and violence, you don't necessarily think about good manners, but the reality is a place like that, there's a lot of honor. There's a lot of respect. People understand that their name and how they carry themselves is pretty much all they have. And then that's just not a figure of speech. You know, there, you could be down on a lot of people are down. You know, that's how you end up in a project. Certainly not the place you end up in when life is going well. And uh, a lot of people, all they had to, you know, was their name and their respect. And if you threaten that, then you were threatening the very thing that gave them any type of distinguishment, even if it wasn't um, positive distinguishment, even if it wasn't something that you would think would elevate a person, to them it was their name and it was their pride, it was their respect. And, you know, today a lot of people don't don't realize this or don't behave in this way. And I think it is due largely uh, in part to the Internet era and the social media era. You know, this is the first time in history you could be disrespectful to someone 
and talk all kinds of reckless to them and not have to deal with the possibility of a physical interaction or a physical confrontation that, that comes from your disrespect. But growing up in that environment, that was always a constant thought in the back of my head. And it developed within me a sense of just default respect for people. Because here's the thing. You you never know uh, where someone's space is, like where they're at in their head. If you decide to pop off at the wrong person, even if you were in the right, if you decide to pop off at the wrong person, you know, you never know. This person could be could could not it could be having a worse day right uh that's kind of obvious it could be somebody that just doesn't give a damn about going back to jail a lot of people carry guns right and they ain't gonna kill you they might pistol whip you might shoot you in your leg or some something, something wild uh point is though you, you you never knew and you didn't want these these type of problems anyway because there wasn't a clear end to them you know a lot of housing projects are one way in one way out you get into a fight with somebody you got to grow up and and live with that person as you continue uh to grow and and up there you know people people will will not take a disrespect slightly because you at the very least you have to balance the scales you have to come back with retribution and in many cases that's not enough you got to go beyond retribution you have to let the person know, you know, and send a message to everyone else. I'm not the person to mess with. I'm not the person to disrespect. So you can you can avoid a lot of problems. Just simply, you know, apologizing whenever you, you have a problem. Just going, you know, my bad. A real simple phrase. Uh, my bad, dude. Didn't mean to step off. Boom. Show some respect and just, and just keep it moving. It ain't got to be a big thing. You know, you ain't got to get your ego involved. You just got to go, look, this could go worse. You know, we both got got something to lose and it really comes back to a, a value of of your physical life and life in general and then our healthy respect for the consequences you know because you, you can't guarantee the other person is going to have a healthy respect for how bad things could get but so you got to have that and that always stuck with me uh, that leads nicely into the next lesson uh, about safety and security i, I don't remember in my childhood, I don't remember uh, things that were feeling safe, you know. Uh, certainly not outside my home. There was no real safety. I mean, uh, school, you could be jumped on the bus home, being a bus home, being the bus home. You could be jumped uh, walking up and down the street. Anything could happen to you. Somebody could run up on you, rob you or something like that, get the wrong person. Things happened all the time. And then in my home, I didn't feel safe. Because, you know, you get your head popped off by your mom or something or she's going through her things and her issues. And, and a lot of times the that was taken out on us. Uh, so there's a lot of so there, so there's never a, a feeling of safety. Uh, and then and then, you know, aside from walking on the street or feeling like your, your mother's going to kick your ass. There's also uh, the fear. I, I went through a, a long period of time man, where I didn't feel safe. Uh, going to sleep i would wake up double check triple check the doors and the windows because we got robbed once uh, so i never i never got comfortable in my life there was never a baseline of comfort and and i think that continues to serve me well to this day because i never i never think things are going to be easy if they are that's nice uh, but the reality is Hard is the default. Difficult is the default. You know, uh, when, when there are moments where it's comfortable, where it's nice, I always think about how that's going to go away or what's going to interfere with it. And, and I think about how to be tough and how to deal with that. There, there was never a place, you know, I know a lot of kids get this, and, and I think that's what we're supposed to do for children, which is we're supposed to uh, foster an environment for them to grow up safely and without these cares and without these adult worries but the reality is you know I, I never got the ability to do that and and the worry part is, is really interesting you know I think about, about one of the formative memories is is watching my mom uh, get drunk and get into a fight with, with somebody in the streets and we're telling her uh, not to go out there not to do do this not to not be crazy i'm i'm the one holding her back trying to keep from going out and, and i'm 11 right i'm an 11 year old kid and 
in my mind, I'm like, why aren't you listening? This seems seems clear. But she's like, nah, she got to go take care of this and got arrested. And when she got arrested, you know, I remember thinking, I was like, wow, you know, I'm in this thing alone. I got to really figure out how to deal with this. Now, she, I think she was released like the next uh, night or something. She had to deal with deal with some stuff. But but think about the message that that, that sends. It's a very powerful message uh, to a kid. I was like, okay, it's just me. And I got to make sure I can figure this out because it's clear that I, I've got the better sense here. And at that point forward... I think I grew up real fast. I think every kid in these environments, if they have any hope of surviving, they have to grow up real fast. You don't get to enjoy your childhood in a way that I think a lot of people who are outside of this environment get to. And that has a lot of of problems. You know, you only see the people who survive and make it out. Then, you know, survivorship bias, you only see the winners. You don't forget that for every person like me or every person that you see that's made some other life from that environment that there is a boatload a long list of losers of and and they lose to the system they end up being innocent bystanders or something they end up repeating the cycle maybe getting get having a bunch of kids early and they can never better themselves maybe they just straight up don't have the desire to better themselves there are all types of things that that pull a person down in that environment. Peer pressure is immense if you want to be liked. Fortunately, I wasn't that well liked and, and never really chased it. That's just, just luck that I was born that way. Not everyone is born that way, though. Okay? So, like, there are so many things that can that, that threaten the safety and security of a child's ability to, to develop and grow in this environment that if you do make it out, yeah, you, you get someone like me who can sit here and talk to you about about the challenges and the setbacks, but that's not common. And I think it's important for people to realize that, yeah, you know, you can go to gladiator school, but if you don't make it out of gladiator school, there ain't no, there ain't no, all right, man, nice try. You, you get thrown to the pits. You, you're just not a gladiator. You didn't survive, you know? So that's a, that's a, a big lesson. That safety and security is not a real thing, and I never let myself fall into it. And part of the reason you never <laughs> feel safe and secure is the next lesson. You know, I learned real early. You know, it's not the it's not the money is the root of all evil. Uh, the lack of money is the root of all evil. I saw a lot of atrocities uh, growing up. And a lot of them were centered around the acquisition of money just to survive. Uh, you think, you know, a lot of the drugs uh, that are that are sold and the violence that accompanies that, that's all because people, somebody looked at the their options and they said, you know, slinging dope in the corner, it's going to make me a lot more money a lot faster than going to get a legit one down at Mickey D's or something, flipping burgers or, or working a hard, you know, shift in the warehouse or something like that. And and we're not speaking to the the foolishness of that, that decision, you know, looking at looking at honest work that's not gonna put you in the in harm's way and versus work that's gonna put you in the block, put you in the corner and have you taking not only risk to your safety and well being, but then supplying and poison other people and it's against the law, so you got to deal with that that pressure. All I'm saying is I understand how a person looks at the options in front of them. And you, you factor that in with all the role models around them, everything they see. And they go, you know what? I think slinging dope is a better decision, and I'm going to go do that. So I, I, can see, I see that. You know, pe- people weren't breaking in my house for food. They were breaking in to get things to steal. They weren't breaking in to hurt people. They were breaking in to steal. You know, I watched one time. I think I was like 13 or 14. I watched these these hooligans order a pizza on Christmas Eve, and the pizza delivery driver came up, was looking, and and you know they should have known better. You know I know some places they just weren't delivering pizza to these spots, and then other places sent two dudes, one to carry the gun, one to carry the money. They sent this long kid up there, and man, they stomped the dog piss out this kid, took the pizza and the money. Right on Christmas Eve. Now you think about how much money a pizza delivery driver is going to even be carrying, man. We're talking like what, maybe a hundred dollars, and like maybe, but that's a big difference to somebody who's living on. I think at one point, uh, 
to quote, we were we were beneath the poverty line for most of my childhood. And, and at that point, I looked this up because I was doing some research uh, for something else one day. And I think the poverty line uh, for a lot of my childhood was like between seven or eight thousand dollars a year. To put that in perspective, man, that's less than a thousand dollars a month. So a hundred dollars is gonna make a real big difference to somebody whose rent is subsidized, I based off of that, you know. So so sometimes rent was like two hundred dollars. Sometimes it was like fifty, right? So a lot of, of horrible things are done in the name of not having enough money. Certainly way more than than people who are have affluence. You know, I'm not I'm not saying people with money don't don't commit atrocities and commit crimes. But what I am saying is that in, in terms of the violent crime and and the evil that is done, a lot of the collateral damage on society, yeah, a lot of that is is driven by people who are just trying to survive, man, and doing it really the best way they've learned how and know how, and they've been taught that. You know, you forget, you know, if your kid's born in this environment and all they come up and see is this environment, and then you got the music and the media telling them or encouraging them in many ways to follow these these footsteps, it's it's not going to be pretty, man. What what turn? But what, what ends up happening is a lot of behavior to chase the dollar and that behavior is almost never ethical or done the right way when it comes from this type of environment but those experiences they open up the window for something else and 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 i think this is where uh one of my favorite one of my favorite uh practices comes from and i think a defining trait of my life uh, the next lesson the thing i learned from that environment is gratitude and you, you really learn it could always be worse. Things were bad, you know, but were they that bad? Well, I learned to be real grateful early on, for example, that I had a roof over my head. I remember coming home one day in the fifth grade, walking past somebody that was getting evicted the week before Christmas. It's crazy, man. If you ain't never seen the eviction squad come up in, uh, come up in a housing project, uh, what they do, they got out, they they bring law enforcement, and then they they have. They have the goons who who are on the movement squad and they're just just taking people's stuff out, putting it outside, and it and it can't sit outside for too long. Uh, so so you got to do something with all your stuff. Uh, a lot of times you weren't even you weren't even thinking about uh, where you were going to, to store it because you got to figure out where you going to sleep tonight. And it's it's a rough situation. It can always uh, be worse. You know I know somebody who's whose mom, one of my neighbors, man, they was a straight up crackhead. We used to go to sleep next to somebody uh, who was always, get, you know, some woman that was always, always getting, getting the snot beat out of her, man, by her drug dealing boyfriend. And these are the things you just get used to, and you start be feeling real grateful that uh, you don't have these problems, that these people are not living next, are living in your house, that that, that your mother, you know, is able to you know, put some food on the table and keep a roof over your head. You know, my mom used to always say, like, I put food on the table and keep a roof over your head. And, and yeah, one could argue that's the bare minimum. But at the same time, until you see, until you're around a lot of other people who ain't got that, yeah, you, you, you real quick. And, and it stays with you. That, that, that really stays with you, that feeling of gratitude. It certainly stayed with me. Anyone that's interacted with me on uh, social media, they understand and they know I talk a big game about gratitude because it is that important to me because I've seen I've been I've been at the bottom and but but it wasn't quite the bottom it was very close to it but it was close enough to have a perspective at the next level down and the next level down is <laughs> it can always be worse and when you remember that uh when you remember that it keeps it keeps you you, you it just lets you be happy about what you got, man. Too many people, uh, you should always strive for more and be ambitious. But at the same time, uh, you don't need to curse where you're at currently. I think when you do that, you miss out on the opportunity, uh, as they say, to stop and smell the roses and appreciate that they're even there, man. A lot of people ain't even got roses. You know, um, some mornings I remember, you know, uh, as I was poor in my, my mid-20s, I remember waking up just making, being like, man, I'm grateful I got coffee. I'm grateful I figured out how to, how to uh, keep a roof over my head is, as a young adult, it might not be the ideal situation, but I was just happy that I was able to do that. 
And from there, you know, you build and you become more ambitious and you let things happen. But at no point should you ever uh, curse your situation. Always look about how it can be worse. And then that'll really put your mind in the right place to where you can make moves. Uh, going on a completely, uh, not completely different note, but, but not a nice little lead in. Uh, one of the things that people well, people forget is that in this environment, there's, there's a lot of violence. It's, it's a way, you know, it's it's it's, it's very much in, in the weirdest way. It's like an honor culture. In an honor culture, uh, everything is really based on who is, there's a hierarchy, right? And that hierarchy is not just randomly decided, you know, a lot of it is sorted based on what you're capable of accomplishing and doing against other people and, and in the in the basis way possible. What's what's what are the common things, you know? Um so so if if you're not an athlete, you know, you're probably gonna have to fight some people. Uh and even then you still might have to fight them. Uh and one thing I learned real quick, real early, is you don't you don't back down from fights, man. Um if if I, I never started fights because because you you develop a healthy respect for violence and what it can do, but when I I think you know I think when I was uh my sister was born so I'd have been three or four man I got a, I got a memory seared in my head watching this kid get uh hit by a car run over killed you know so you you grow up with a real appreciation for the fragility of the human structure and that. <laughs> makes you not want to engage in, in anything that can damage that. But when you are, you don't have a choice and you have to fight, you have to get involved in these contests, you know, uh, you, you got to swing to kill, man, almost. You got to be ready to go all the way. You got to be ready to defend yourself to the best of your ability because... A lot of people who decide to fight you, you know, like like I, I make the distinction in another article. Uh, there's bullies and there's jackals, you know. Uh, bullies just they just want to see what they can get out of you. They want to they want to take on a, a soft target. So if you make yourself a hard target, you know, you carry yourself a certain way. When things, you know come up and about to pop off you gain a reputation for the guy that you know swings first ask questions later uh they tend to stay away and they're not going to be a problem the problem are people that 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 are looking for that confrontation they're looking for that violence they're looking for the for the uh the situation and i know a few of these guys like that there there was no standing up to these dudes because all it did was just it was like pouring gasoline on a fire there was no water there was no way to put it out Right. So you just had to fight and had to deal. And then gradually um, what I learned is how to put myself in situations where this wasn't even going to be a thing or wasn't going to be an issue. And an ounce of prevention is, is really worth <laughs> way more than a pound of cure when it comes to dealing with, with violent individuals. But one thing that, that really taught me was, I mean, that there's there's a lot to be said for standing up for yourself. You know, you you see that today, I think, in a lot of the ways people attack you on social media or with cancel culture. The worst thing you can do is apologize to these people uh, because what you've done, you you now you've backtracked on your stance and you've exposed the juggler. You've exposed your weak side running away and it's going to attack because that's what they're here to do. They're here to attack. They're not, they, they, they never come to negotiate, right? They come to cause pain. They come to make your life miserable. They come to alter or remove the ease in your experience of living. And uh, all you can do is is fight that and fight back. And and that's an attitude that I take with me uh, and have carried with me my whole life. So uh, those are those are some of the lessons. You know, I'll probably revisit this. I didn't even talk about uh, the phenomena known as crackheads, but there, there's it's a whole 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 long lesson list of, of of things we can learn from crackheads that people don't even think about. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoy, and the rest is up to you. <laughs>